Scottish composer by the name of Henry Francis Light wrote that song. He wrote it in 1947. And he wrote it as he lay dying from tuberculosis. He died three weeks after he wrote that song. He said, in the darkest hour of my life, you remember that last verse we sung, O grave, where is thy victory? Death, where, where is thy sting, right? We think sometimes that we have a monopoly on pain, a monopoly on suffering. Listen, a lot of other people suffer. A lot of other people have pain. What will you do with your pain? What will you do with it? I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew uh, chapter number 6. And an uh, interesting uh, message titled this morning. Uh, the title is No Worries. No Worries. And uh, that is uh, famous in some uh, parts of the world. It's going to be all right. It's okay, right? No, no worries. And you, you think to yourself, well, that's great. And I'm going to preach a message called Life with No Worries. And you're going to say, Jonathan, you just are out of touch with where I live. You're out of touch with reality. What in the world are you talking about? But I want to challenge you this morning that you can have a life with no worries. I'm not going to tell you to move somewhere and let's set up a, a state and let's uh, all cooperate together and we're just going to create a life with no worries. That's not where I'm going this morning. I'm not even saying that life is going to be easy. I'm not saying that it's going to be without pain. I'm saying you can live a life with no worries. Say, Jonathan, what in the world are you talking about? Worry. It is a small word but it consumes much of our lives. We, we worry about all kinds of things. But if we were to boil worry down, anxiety down to its basis form, we all struggle with things that are beyond our control. We all struggle with the unknown. So I'm going to try to be as forthright as I can this morning and hear me as I say this, it's all beyond your control. It's all unknown to us. It's all beyond our control. It's, it's all unknown to us. The, the indisputable fact is that worry is an almost universal tendency. Everyone who lives uh, the, in the human race deals, deals with worry. And, and to be honest, it's as addictive as drugs, and, and it affects you in some, in some dangerous ways. And we tend to worry about all kinds of things. And, and sometimes when we can't find anything to worry about, we worry about that because something bad must be coming. Unfortunately, worry is one of those things that's kind of treated as acceptable. In, in our Christian culture, and, and we tend to accept him because it is, it is prevalent. And many of us feel as though it cannot be controlled. But I want to give you this thought this morning. God's word, I believe, teaches us that worry is unreasonable. It's unnecessary. It's unrewarding. It is unwise. And if we're going to be perfectly honest, I believe it's sinful. But let me continue on and say this. It is possible to live your life with no worries. You say, how in the world do you propose we do that? And I would submit this thought to you. And I think our text tells us exactly, uh, exactly this. While life may be unknown to us and while it may be beyond our control, it is not beyond God. I, uh, I've been reading lately a lot from Corey ten Boom. Corey ten Boom. And uh, Corey ten Boom, of course, was a, a German who tried to uh, save Jews, was caught, placed in a concentration camp. Matter of fact, I believe last week I used a story about Corey ten Boom and the fleas. Remember that? She was able to have her Bible study because of the fleas. I, I find that Corey ten Boom is a remarkable woman, and I enjoy quoting people that are quotable, and Corey ten Boom is most certainly quotable. And one of my favorite quotes of hers is this, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. 
Ne never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. So this morning, I want to challenge you with the thought, you can live your life with no worries. Now, I want to lay the context of our passage, and we'll jump right into it this morning. Uh, where this takes place is on a, on a, mo a mountain. It's apart from the mixed multitudes. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. If you'll take your attention to Matthew chapter 4 in your Bibles and look back at verse number 23, this kind of lays the stage for what's happening here. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people, and his fame went throughout all Syria. They brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were, were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And sometimes you think you go to the church with some strange people, right? Verse number 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. In verse number 25, we see great multitudes of people from, from everywhere. And can I submit to you, these are not just Jews. Uh, Decapolis, there is a ma mainly a Gentile place. It's, uh, Decapolis is a group of 10 small cities uh, joined together. So it's made mostly up of a Gentile population. What are you saying? I'm saying Jesus is healing ministry attracted the Jews and, and the Gentiles. They wanted a part of this. Why? Because, I mean, he's healing. He's doing great works. He is, he's, he's ministering to the least of these. I went in on that, right? But verse number, tw uh, verse number one of chapter number five says this, after seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and he goes on to give us the Beatitudes, uh, the salt of the earth. He teaches us on murder and anger and temptation and divorce, on forgiveness, loving one's enemies. He goes into chapter 6 and begins to talk about uh, giving and prayer and fasting and living for eternity. And then we find ourselves in our text this morning. But I want to I lay this out to you that uh, Jesus has brought apart uh, not the multitudes, but he's brought apart the disciples. Now, when we're talking about the disciples, he has not yet named specifically the 12 disciples. So uh, right now we've only seen four disciples that we know of that have been called at this point. Uh, but if you'll take your Bible to Matthew chapter number seven and look at verse number 28, the Bible tells us that he ends this sermon with the, the challenge of building on a solid foundation, foundation. Verse number 28, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now, his crowd has not changed. He's speaking to the disciples, but there was a group of them. There was a large portion. And I believe this. I believe he ministered to many people, but only some chose to actually follow him and be his disciples. Right? And so this treatise that we see in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, this sermon that we see, he's speaking to his disciples. Now, let me, let me kind of continue on in our, in our groundwork here. He, he's challenging them and he's teaching them uh, what it takes to, to be a follower of Christ. And he challenges many, many thoughts. Matter of fact, in chapter number six, he says, you have heard that it has been said an eye, an eye, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, and over and over, he says, you've heard it said this and you've heard it said this, but I say unto you, and he spells it out even further. And he explains to them, it, it is a big thing to follow me. And that brings us to verse number 25. And we'll read from 25 to 34. He says, therefore, I say unto you. Now, that therefore is there because he's, he's spoken to them all these other truths. And now he's, he's, he's stopping for a moment. He's transitioning. That therefore is a transition. He's transitioning to this thought. And we're going to expound on this in a moment. But therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And then he asks this question. I want you to picture yourself sitting there. You're a follower of Christ. 
he's just challenged you with a revolutionary way of thinking. And he says, are ye not much better than they? Continue reading in verse number 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You notice how he's continuing to ask them questions? He's asking them questions. He's provoking thought. He's asking them to think through this. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. I want you to think about what that says once more. For your heavenly Father that ye knoweth that ye have, next word, need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take th thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil Thereof, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. And God, I beg of you that you'd work in our hearts this morning. I thank you for the work you've done in my heart in this passage. I thank you for how it has helped me. And I pray now that as I give it to your people, it would help them. I pray that you'd help us all to take pause in life and, and consider and prioritize the things that matter. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to live as Jesus challenged these disciples for eternal things, for things that will outlast us. Well, they're so easy to get caught up in life, get caught up in comparison, get caught up in the challenge and the grind. But, Father, I pray that you'd help us to live for eternal things. And God, I'll give you glory for what you do here. I thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word and your spirit. And I pray they minister to us as you'd have them to. I pray that you'd be with the children in junior church this morning, those who will teach. I pray that you give them wisdom and clarity. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to see, first of all, in the first verse here, a radical challenge. He says in verse number 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than me and the body than raiment? I don't know about you, but I typically don't eat breakfast on Sunday morning. Uh, that is kind of my internal clock that tells me it is time to quit preaching because I am very hungry. Are you with me? If I eat, you're in trouble because I'm full and I'm not hungry and we're going to keep going. Are you with me this morning? Uh, I, I enjoy eating. I, uh, I do. It is, it is, a, uh, is a blessing. Uh, I, uh, I spent some time yesterday uh, with Stephen and Stephen cooked for me. And I love Stephen more today than I did yesterday. I enjoy eating. But more than I enjoy eating, I, I need to eat. Now, maybe you're looking at me and you're saying to yourself, he needs to eat less. And I would agree, I do need to do that, and I'm working on that. But all of us need to eat. Is that fair? Have you ever went a significant period of time without drinking? That's a bad day, <laughs> right? Need to drink. Uh, our dog recently got, uh, got spayed, and they would not let her drink for a day after and uh, I felt horrible for our dog because she was incredibly thirsty. And so I broke down and I gave her water. Why? Because she was thirsty. We need water to live, right? Would we agree with that? Uh, some of you are sunburnt today. You understand that clothing is helpful, especially in Florida, right? Because that sun bears down. We would all agree we need, we need clothing, amen? We, we agree with that. He's talking to the disciples and he's telling them, listen, don't even think about what you eat or you drink or what you put on your body. And he challenges them, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? I want you to think about this. He's not challenging them to deny their desires. He's challenging them to deny, not deny, but ignore their needs. 
And here's why I believe he's doing this. Now, I want you to understand the context of what is, what is happening here. He's gone through this sermon and he's been challenging them. Everything that he said between chapter number five and where we're at in chapter number six, he's challenged them to please God and not please man. What's happened is religion has become a lot of men pleasing and, and he's challenging them that you're to live for eternal things. You're not to live for temporary pleasures. You're not li to live for temporary approval. You're to live for eternal things. And he was revolutionary in that he challenged the way that they give and the way that they pray and the way that they fast. In verses number 19 through 24, he says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor, moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21, the verse we love, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse number 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So he issues them a radical challenge. He's told them uh, to, to pray and to give and to fast for God's approval. He's told them to live a life uh, laying up treasures in heaven. And then he continues on and says, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? He's challenging them with a radical challenge. He's saying, forget about all that you live for right now. And I believe the reason that he's saying what he's saying in this moment is I believe that his crowd, his disciples are beginning to think to themselves, wow, this is going to be difficult. Wow, this is going to be hard. Man, this is going to be a challenge. And if they're anything like Jonathan Redford, they're starting to think to themselves, how am I going to do this? How can I live a life this devoted to this cause and be able to, to get by? How am I going to be able to, to live out this gospel? What is this going to cost me? Those around me that don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to they're gonna cast me out. Some of my relationships are going to be severed. Some of my friendships are going to be in flux. I mean, I believe if they're anything like me, they're starting to think to themselves, wait a second. Are you following me? And these verses immediately proceed. Lay, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust, dust corrupt or thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He's saying, don't live for what you're living for now. Live for eternal rewards. So the successful fishermen that are following him right now, he's saying, leave your successful business and follow me. All right, are you following? And so if, if they're anything like us, I think they're starting to to think a little bit and they're starting to doubt. And I think they're starting to be a bit anxious. And I think they're starting to worry a bit. And we've seen before in scripture where Jesus knew the thoughts of his audience, right? We've seen before where Jesus understood exactly who he was speaking to and he stops. And, it, and if you read the entire passage, he, he's, he's going, 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 going. And then he says, therefore, he stops. He takes pause. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, or what you wear. Isn't the body more than raiment, more than food, right? It continues on here. Let's continue on in, in our passage. We've seen this radical challenge. Uh, by the way, he challenges them not to worry, not about their wants, but their needs. He says, don't worry about your needs. Verse number 26 there, he gives them a specific reminder. He says, behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He, he begins by reminding them that birds require provision from God. He said they, didn't, they don't grow, they don't plant, they don't water, they don't uh, source their food. It's not like the birds have a fail safe. You following what I'm saying? If there's famine, the birds are, the birds are in trouble, right? 
They rely on the sustenance that's given them from the Father. He gives them what they need. And he tells the disciples, if God can do that for the birds, don't you think he can do that for you? If God can do that for the birds, don't you think he can do that for you? Now, now I want to I want to pause a moment and say this. This message at first doesn't resonate on our ears. And here's why. Because most of us have forgotten what it feels like to have needs. Now, I'm stepping on toes. I know I'm stepping on toes, but hold on here. Just hold up. Say, Jonathan, you don't understand. I have a need. My house payment is due at the end of the month and my car payment and blah, blah, blah. You understand you live in a nicer house than most of the world. You understand that the car you lease, right? A lot of people don't even have a bicycle. The, the things that are our needs, do we really need them? Now, I'll be the first to get my car after church and go home to my house, right? And I need to pay for those things. Are you following what I'm saying? But how much do I actually need? Because I'll say this, and I, I hope that God doesn't put me to this test, but I'll say this, I could do with a whole lot less than I have. God could take a lot of stuff away from me and me still not be in need. It, Jesus is talking to a group of people. As he is ministering, he's going from city to city. He, he's laying his head from, 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 from rock to rock. He, he doesn't have a place to lay his head. He's traveling. He's ministering. He's expending himself. And he's saying, listen, the only needs that you really actually have are some food in your belly, some water, and, and a little bit of clothing. And I, I, I say my life could have a lot of fat trimmed before I would get to that point. Yeah? But here's the thing. We, we think when we get in dire straits and we start struggling, it's not because we're homeless and we don't know where the next meal comes from. It's because something that we've chosen is tough for us. Yeah? By the way, if you're clamming up about this and you're struggling with this, it, it, people on fixed incomes, I know it's hard, I know it's tough, go to Haiti. I'm not trying to be unkind. We have it very good here. And the, the technology that we have and the amenities that we have, it's been a long time since most of us felt what it was like to actually be in need. So he says to these folks, he says, hey, don't, don't worry about it. God can provide. You know what's interesting to me? I think that this message probably resonated easier with them than with us, even though we have much more. You say, why do you think that? I think they were used to seeing him provide for needs. And I think some of us have forgotten what that looks like. It says in the next verse, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? My whole life, when I've read this verse, I've thought to myself, which of you can think and decide to get a little taller? It's always resonated with me because when I was seventh grade, I was four foot 11. I was tiny. I was a little hobbit child. And uh, I was skinny and I was short and I wore glasses and I love basketball, but those things don't match up, right? Michael Jordan over here, my friend Michael Jordan, he's a basketball player, right? Uh, I was te his name's Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, the great basketball player. So some of you. <clears throat> so I'm four foot 11. I'm this little uh, skinny, tiny white kid from Kentucky wearing these big old spectacle glasses. And I love basketball. And so you can just imagine when I play basketball, I would I would do all my stuff a lot slower than that. I would shoot. And a dude like Stephen would come just pack it into my face. Right. And uh, so I used to, every night, I used to pray, literally, I used to pray, God, please help me to grow up. Like, I knew I hadn't hit my growth spurt, but I mean, I'm like, come on, God. I mean, really, I'm in seventh, God. Puberty happened a little, a little bit ago. I'm like, come on now, right? Four foot 11, used to pray, God, make me taller, make me taller. I used to do silly things to try to make myself taller, uh, such as sleep with things pressing on my feet. By the way, it doesn't work. It just hurts your knees really bad, right? 
Uh, but I used to pray. And so when I've read this verse before, I've always thought, which of you can ha- taking thought can add a, a cubit to his stature? Because cubit is a measurement of length. It's about a foot and a half. It's roughly the, the distance from your elbow to the end of, end of your hand. But that word stature uh, means a couple of different things in Scripture. Number one, it means height, but it also means age. In this place, it's talking age. So it's kind of an interesting sentence. It says, which of you can add a foot and a half to your age? And at first thought, it's like, that doesn't make sense. Those two things don't measure up. And, and I'm not sure exactly uh, what was meant here, but here's the way I take it. Uh, when my time is done, my time's done. Right? My last breath is, is, is done. And, and if I can paint this picture for you, when my time is done, I'll not take one more step. I'll not add one and a half feet to the end of my life. I'll not take one more moment than God has given me. And and can I submit this thought to you? Can I submit this thought to you? Many of us live and we control everything that we can, but you you fail to realize you you cannot control the most important thing. And that is the extent of your life. Your life will end one day and you'll not have a say about it. Park Boulevard, last night, 6.30, couple people driving, drunk, 6.30, runs into him, two people die. They never saw it coming. They did not know it was their time. Are you following what I'm saying? You can't add a single step to your life. And so we live our life, we try to control every single thing we can. But can I say it's all vanity because we can't even add a step to our life? You have no control. So that goes back to what I said at the beginning. You have no control, and there are so many unknowns. And he, and he reminds them here, he, he, if I can summarize it this way, he says this. You can't take a step in your life. You can't add a step. Everything is in God's control. So your worry and your anxiety about your life, it's not going to add a single step. And that's why a guy can sit there as he's dying, three weeks before he dies, and he can write a song about the the peace of God and how it's all okay and God's in control. Why? Because he understands that his worry and his anxiety about his situation won't change it a bit. And he challenges the disciples here and he says, he says, there's no point in worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or, or what you're going to wear. You, you can't add a step to your life. He says, I'm in control of everything about you. And then he goes on in verse number 20, uh, 28, and he says, why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He says, the complexity of the beauty of these flowers Even the beauty of Solomon didn't compare. And if I can make a flower this beautiful, don't you think I can clothe you? Verse number 30, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, by the way, look at this, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven. He says uh, it has one life in it and it burns up. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So, so if you can make the flowers, which die in a season, if you can make them beautiful, what can he do for you? If he pays attention to the detail of a flower that is an, an inanimate, has no feelings or no thoughts or, or, or no worries, right? If he can take care of a flower, what can he do for you? And so he continues on, verse 31 and 32, he says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. And notice he does not shirk on the fact that, yes, these are necessities. He said, I understand. God knows that you have need of these things. They're the three necessities, but they are provided by God. Can I say that most of us live our lives, and we never have to come to that point, just to reiterate what I said a moment ago, we never have to get to that point because we don't know what it's like to actually suffer need. 
You say, Jonathan, are you saying that we shouldn't plan? No, the Bible says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. And it talks about planning and storing and, and, and saving for that rainy. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't plan. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be wise. I'm not sure, saying you should be, uh, shouldn't be prudent. But what I am saying, if you're living your entire life to never be uncomfortable, you're living it the wrong way. You say, Jonathan, who are you to tell me how to live my life? I'm not. He is. Don't shoot the messenger. If you don't know what it's like to ever suffer need, if you don't know what it's like to ever sacrifice, if you don't know what it's like to give to the extent that it hurts you, you are not living the way that he commands us to live. That's why the greatest example of giving ever given to us is the widow and her two mites. Why? Because she gave of her necessity. Yeah. Listen to me. She gave of her Necessity. <clears throat> so when's the last time that you actually felt want for something that you needed? When's, when's the last time that you felt like you, <clears throat> you needed? He says in verse 32, for after all these things did the Gentiles seek. He's saying this, this is the focus of the heathens. Okay. So if we were, <clears throat> did I say the widow at Zarephath, by the way? It was not the widow at Zarephath, the widow and her two mites. I'm sorry, two different, two different stories. Okay. So, some people are sitting there like, no, that's not right. That's not right. Uh, the widow and her two mites. <clears throat> he says, for after all these things did the Gentiles seek. He says, this is the focus of the heathen. Their, the desire is to meet uh, their desires and their needs. As Solomon said he brought unto him everything that he could possibly want, and at the end of it he realized that all was vanity. Why he was living for what the world had to offer. Here's the problem. You're not made for this world. And so if you live for this world, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Why? Because sin has corrupted this world. This world is in decay, it's in ruin, it's falling apart, and everything that you would live for here, it's temporal. So, so that's why I, I say till I'm blue in the face, probably every week of the world when I preach, live for something that outlasts you. And that's what he says in, in the verses preceding this passage. He says, lay up not for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because the earth is going to burn up and pass away. So he's preparing the disciples. He's saying, listen, he's saying, don't live for the things of this earth. Why the Gentiles, the heathen seek those. He says, your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Can I say that our goal on this earth is to satisfy God. And he will satisfy our needs. Think about that. It doesn't sound super, super profound, but it really is. If our goal is to satisfy God, he will satisfy our needs. Which me, leads me to verse number 33, the direct promise. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you seek to satisfy God, he will satisfy you. If you worry about God's kingdom, he will take care of yours. Corey Tim Boom, I quoted her earlier. I'll quote her again before we end. He she said, you can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Here's what you realize as you begin to seek God above all, that he'll take care of you. Take care of you. If you'll obey his commandment, which is love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's his, that's his commandment. But then he gives us the commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. If you'll obey his commandment and you'll obey his commission to go reach the world, he will take care of you. He'll meet your needs. You say, but Jonathan, it's uncomfortable. I want you to try to just think of something with me. And it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be hard and it, it gives me a headache. And so maybe you'll get one too. Or maybe you're smarter than me and it'll take you longer. Uh, think about infinity. Think about time without end or beginning. 
think about an endless period. Think about life forever. Think about the course of history, just the course of history. We believe that creation probably 6,000 years ago or so. Just think back that far. Think about the generations, the men and women who've lived and died, the civilizations that have risen and fallen. Think about all that's transpired just in that blip of time, and that doesn't even, that's not a drop in the hat because it's, it's literally unquantifiable. Because you cannot measure time to infinity. It is literally impossible. And so many people live for this little blip that we have no idea. And, and here, here's the deal. We think, okay, uh, uh, 70 years. Let's say 70 years. If we're lucky, 100. Some people, 110. I think the oldest person, 120, right? Something like that, round, round about. And, and we think we're going to live. But the truth is it could end at 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 or 40 or 45. We don't know when the last step is, right? And we can't, giving, giving thought, we can't add to that step. So we have what little bit of time that we have. What are you saying? I'm saying spend the time that you have, which is what? It's the moment you're in. If you're here and you're breathing and you have breath in your lungs and you woke up this morning and you had life, that is the time that you have. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised the next moment. So what are you saying? I'm saying live in this moment to please God. Live in this moment to seek the kingdom of God. Live in this moment because you don't know when your time is up. See, we live for things that don't matter. We, we live for things that don't matter. Are you saying you can't have fun? No, I, I believe God wants us to relax. I believe God wants us to, to have fun. But we live for things that don't matter. That takes us to our fourth thought here. <clears throat> the final directive. He says this, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, this is a beautiful summary, and here it is. Don't spend your life worrying about tomorrow. Why? Because tomorrow is going to be bad enough on its own. That's literally what it's saying here. Look at the end there. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He, sa he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Just get through today. Tomorrow, tomorrow will come, and tomorrow is going to have its own set of problems. That's why. But take your Bibles to Lamentations, would you? Take your Bibles to Lamentations. Lamentations chapter number 3. It says in verse number 21, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are, look at what it says. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, while I hope in him, the Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. W what are you saying? I'm saying God gives you strength. You ready for this? Listen to me. This, I hope this helps you. This, this really helped me. God gives you strength for today. Now, I have hope for tomorrow, but I have strength for today. Corey Tim Boom said this, worrying is carrying tomorrow's love with today's strength. It carrying two days at once. It's, it's moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. So, so I open by saying it's possible to live life with no worries. Because while life may be unknown to us, and while it may be beyond our control, it is not beyond God. So, so if I can just summarize, and if I, can, if I can give you this picture, this is the picture I want to leave you with. Stop worrying about the future. To be honest, you may not even be there. Or it may not be there. Uh, things tend to tend to come and go. Life changes in just the, the blink of an eye. What are you saying? I'm saying God gives you strength to live through today. He gives you mercies every morning. His faithfulness is great toward you, but it's given to you in small measures. Why? Because he wants you to continually go back to him for strength. So quit worrying about next week and next month and next year and live today with all of your might for God's glory. 
You give him everything you have and, and know that he is good and he is in control. And by the way, let me say this in summary. In, in conclusion here, he's painting a picture. He's weaving a picture that you can't see right now. Have you ever seen a tapestry? Tapestry on the front, beautiful picture on the back. Threads and line. you cannot tell what it is. So if you come to a tapestry while somebody's making it, you'll see just a jumble of, 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 of threads and a jumble of colors. And you'll think to yourself, uh, I hate to tell them this, but they're not very good at that. But the, the person who's making it, the maker themselves, they, they know what they're making and they have the picture in their mind. And at the end of that thing, when they flip it over, it's a beautiful, a beautiful picture. But to us, while we're looking at it as it's being done, we can't see. We don't understand. We don't know what it is. And that is the way with life. We, we don't know what God is doing. And I can't tell you his plan. I, I don't know. I don't know his plan for my life, much less your life. But I do know this. It is his plan and it is good because he is good. What are you saying? Quit worrying about all the things you don't know and live for the things you do. Live for the pleasure of God. Live your life for something that outlasts you. Corey Tim Boom, in closing, wrote a poem. And it was a beautiful poem. It was called The Tapestry or The Weaving. It says this, my life is but a weaving between my God and me. I can't choose the colors he weaves steadily. Oft times he weaves sorrow. And I am foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Knowing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those. You ready for this? Who leave the choice to him. What are you saying? Don't spend your life trying to wrest control of it from God. Because you'll never win and you'll make a mess of your life. And that's what he's saying to them. He's saying all the worries that are filling your mind in this moment, all the concerns that you have, stop and trust God that he'll take care of you. So so wherever you are this morning, you're, you're burdened down with worry. You can't see what God is doing. Can I say that you can live a life with no worries? How does it happen? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He'll take care of you. By the way, there's that passage I love. If you know how to good, give good gifts to your children, don't you think your father can give you good gifts? Right. He loves you. He wants to see you succeed. I, I'm not going to sit here and give you just a, a prosperity gospel, but God wants to prosper you. And, and God does prosper you. And it comes in waves and it comes in seasons and it's not comfortable sometimes, but he's faithful. So wherever you are, whatever you're going through, no worries. No worries. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts as we move into a time of response. Father, I pray that you would be with each of us. I pray that those of us that are feeling that darkness discouragement, that depression, the weight of our worry, the anxiety that seems to consume us. Father, I pray that you would help us to let that go. God, I pray that you'd help us to live for you and allow you to be our strength, allow you to be our fulfillment. I pray that you'd move now in our midst. In Jesus' name, I pray. Would you stand to your feet with your eyes closed, your heads bowed?